Long the squad. Long the squad. They'll never do it in time. The code, the code, they do out the code. They'll be looking for us. The place is first, the server is second. Long order, we shot him. They'll be looking for us. The place is served. This first is checked. Right more. Down more. Right more. Left more, left more, wrong part. More, right more, right more, right more, wrong order, we shot him. Wrong order, we shot him.
17 bomb.
Space Spartan. Hello, Commander. Computer reporting. Energy level 10,000. Tracking off. Shield. Shield. Zero. Shield. Off. Shield. Off. Hyperdrive. Off. Starbase one. Under attack. Starbase one. Under attack. Starbase one. Under attack. Zero million. Energy level 9000. Hyperdrive off. Starbase 1 under attack. I've been comparing the exciting new in television space game Star Strike with one of the most popular Atari games, Asteroid. Star Strike has moving images that make the game appear three-dimensional. Asteroids doesn't. And Star Strike features our most exciting visual effect, total destruction of a planet. This is what the other game offers, which is why after Star Strike, Asteroids left me rather flat. Star Strike, new for Intellivision from Mattel Electronics. Here I was, working for Mattel Toy Company, and Mattel had come out with this big innovation of open job posting, and I went down to the cafeteria, and there's this whole big bulletin board full of little three by five cards with jobs posted on them. First card I see in the upper left hand corner says, Senior Systems Programmer, Design and Develop Handheld and Video Games. And I thought to myself, yeah, they're going to pay me to do this? When you're preparing an operating system, it's nice if you have the sense for, for how the operating system is going to be used. And there's a, a big chicken and egg issue in that once you create a, a feature in the operating system, yes, do you need it? It's like you want to have a game to test the operating system and have the sense that you're writing the right operating system for the game. And you, you want to have the operating system with the game there to know that you're meeting the needs of the game. So we kind of had to work on two things at once while there was still some flexibility. I mean, once I started to tell other people about executive uh, features, and we had some other people, and we were starting to bring them online, and then they'd say, OK, I'm using such and such a feature. And I said, what? I wanted to take that feature out. Because we, we had very limited uh, real estate here. We had 4K uh, for the executive program. And so you know, it rapidly gets to the point where if something has to go in, then something else has to come out. And once other people say, well, I'm depending upon that being there, you can't take that feature out. Uh, well, it, it's a messy and difficult process. And what it means is that you, you, know, you, you essentially get one pass to get the exec right, and then it's frozen. The, uh, the part of the, about Space Partner that I was happiest with was the maneuver uh, language that I wrote, which was a little tiny set of tables and a very, very, very compact piece of code that was 
very long because I had to write so many comments to explain what the heck it was doing because it was totally not obvious. But basically what it would do is it would set up the formation. So you'd have the ships flying in little uh, uh, barrel rolls or coming in from the side or coming in from the top and looping around like this or whatever maneuver they may do. Uh, and it would mirror them and in, in back and forth and turn them upside down so they wouldn't look all the same every single time you tried to play the game. Uh, that was a real nice compact little piece of code and it worked very effectively at getting some variety in the game. Now I've been writing the track computer at the same time that, that he's doing these, uh, that he's making all these motions that the, that the ships are doing. I've got no idea what the ships are going to be doing, so, so the tracking computer really is tracking the computers, tracking the alien ships, and it doesn't know what they're going to do ahead of time. Gabriel uh, came to me and said that he really wanted an abstract game, and I said, well, you know, um, kind of like what? And he said, well, that's, that's just it. I want it completely abstract, totally unrelatable to anything. So we put together Vectron. Um, it's first called Vectrix, and we went through several other different names, uh, ultimately to put together the game, which we finally finished which was subsequently released and pretty much marketing came back to us and said, you know, what are we going to be able to do with this game? We can't really relate it to anything. It's a little too abstract. So I guess we kind of did our job uh, maybe a little too well because um, it's kind of this game that's way out there. And, and now my kids sort of look at me and say, what were you thinking when you did this game? <laughs> B-17 was the ultimate terror of a release of a product because we literally were told that it had to be finished on a given date so that they could get the factory going to manufacture the product because if we didn't manufacture it, they would lose tens of thousands of dollars and we'd all be killed or something along those lines. And so what I, what I had to do is we had one last bug. It was half an hour before we had to get the thing starting to burn the ROMs and we had to fix the thing. We had three decals left in the code. We tested it for five minutes. Gee whiz, it looks like it runs. That's fine. We didn't change anything else. It's probably not broken. Started burning the ROMs tested while we were burning the ROMs and ran down with the, the ROMs to the people to get it out in the shipment to get it out to the factory so we could uh, make the Christmas date or whatever it was. But uh, that was rather terrifying. We had literally half an hour of QA on the product before we shipped it. And then we've shipped the game and, and my father-in-law comes over and I've shown him this game that, that we've just finished and he's playing it for the first time and he's played it for 10 minutes and he hangs the game. It is a fairly odd little game. It's, it's kind of a shoot 'em up it's kind of educational. God knows when I was testing it, I got really good at mental arithmetic. You know, if you want to know what 7 times 13 plus 21 is, I can whip it right out. 122, 112. All right, hey. Party Line was a, another high point in my life. Uh, Bill Fisher, Keith Robinson, and myself went out to lunch one day and, uh, you know, we were just talking and, and all of a sudden it came up, you know, wouldn't it be a cool idea to have a party line of games at Mattel? And that the idea just kind of stuck with us and we got really excited about it. We started thinking about how we could present this, built up a whole, you know, storyboard, sales pitch. We pitched it to our managers and to Gabriel Baum and uh, they loved it. And, to the point where they sent around a memo later congratulating us on the best marketing pitch from a set of programmers ever. And, uh, and, and they went ahead and started th seriously considering doing the line of products. And so we worked up uh, several more concepts and uh, we're just in the midst of trying to build that line of products and get it out to market. And then the whole situation with Mattel started changing. Well, that was the real motivation. The, the company was clearly sliding under the waves. And uh, there were a number of us that, that just wanted to get the game in the can before that happened. Uh, you know, get our own little piece of immortality there. Um, and uh, my game spent a lot of time in QA. But we eventually got it in the can. Uh, for Number Jumble, it was a little bit late, though. It was done, the packaging was done, the documentation was done, uh, and then the, the last bomb hit. <laughs> well, I don't think I've ever worked with a better group of people on the game designers and programmers that we had working for Mattel Electronics. It was a great bunch of people, good camaraderie, a lot of fun, a lot of hard work. Um, there were times when people were there late. Uh, there were many times that I pulled all-nighters. and uh, I can remember one time uh, when I had a long drive home, driving over to Steve Ettinger's house and sleeping on the floor there <laughs> instead of going home and going back the next morning. 
it was an extraordinary group of people, you know, that, that, were, that were in something very early on. You know, they talk about, a lot about what sort of the, the younger staff members, and I manage a lot of younger staff members where I work now, um, you know, that they're sort of on the vanguard of something, but compared to what we were in the vanguard of, uh, it was just, it's just, it was a different group of people because we didn't have the luxury of growing up with computers. We, we came to computers as either young adults or adults. We came to computer games that way. Um, we, we learned it all together. It was just, it was an unbelievable experience. And to look to see what everybody is still doing, I mean, we are, we are still at the vanguard. We're, many of us are the vanguard of managing, you know, in more sort of mature companies, you know, that do this sort of thing. Or as the industry matured, a lot of us have been in, in either key roles, either as management or still as technical people or still as designers. And um, I just, I think it's one of the great sort of untold stories about, about about an industry that's redefined America's, you know, uh, prosperity. I mean, you know, people have moved in into all kinds of different fields. I mean, I work in right now in the financial field with computers, um, and I just, I just think it's a great story, and and it's it's just something I've been very proud, you know, of all the places that I've worked. It's one of the places I'm most proud about, and. It's one of the groups of people, even though, even though I'm not in touch with that many of them, I just, I just love to get together and be around them. It's just something great about that. In 1977, Mattel Toys started an electronics division and released the world's first microprocessor-based handheld games. The same year, Atari released the Atari 2600 video game system. Mattel Electronics started development on its own video game system, Intellivision. Test marketed in 1979, it was officially introduced in 1980. Initially, Mattel stressed that Intellivision was intelligent television, not a toy but the cornerstone of a home computer system that would be as educational as it was entertaining. However, Mattel quickly discovered that driving the sales of Intellivision were its screen graphics, which were higher resolution than the Atari 2600. Mattel capitalized on this with a blitz of TV and print ads that featured side-by-side -side comparisons of the Atari and Intellivision systems. Sales of Intellivision skyrocketed, the video game wars had begun. During 1981, Mattel hired programmers as fast as possible to meet the demand for more games. This was a new industry, so enthusiasm and energy were more important than experience. Most of those hired were in their early 20s. For many, designing and television games was their first job. TV Guide profile of the Intellivision programmers dubbed them the Blue Sky Rangers. So many people were arriving, there was no place to put them. Throughout Mattel's headquarters in Hawthorne, California, pockets of Intellivision programmers were crammed wherever some extra office space could be found. Early in 1982, the staff was moved into a warehouse down the block from the main Mattel building. They continued to work on Intellivision games while the warehouse was being remodeled into an office building around them. With Intellivision racking up phenomenal sales, Mattel attacked the market aggressively. A voice module was announced that would add synthesized speech to new games. M-Network, translations of Intellivision games for play on the Atari 2600, was introduced. In 1982, the rate of hiring was increased. Soon there were well over 100 programmers, artists, managers, writers, and others on the second floor of the converted warehouse, all working on game software. The windowless warehouse was open 24 hours a day. The pressure of deadlines was constant. Working late or all night was normal. Because of the odd hours, the programmers, mostly young and single, tended to socialize with each other. Working at Mattel, one artist remarked at the time, was like living in a college dorm. Life seemed to be half stress, half party. Half stress, half party, 
was a good description of the video game industry in general. By summer 1982, the Atari and television war was in full swing. The Atari 2600 was in over 10 million homes, the Intellivision in 3 million. Successful games sold a million plus copies. Other companies were now producing games for one or both systems. Soon a glut of titles flooded the store shelves. Competition was growing increasingly cutthroat. Many of the games in this glut of titles were rushed to market and were of poor quality. Disappointed consumers turned their television sets from video games to the hot new thing, MTV. But Mattel stepped up development and hiring. In Television 2 was introduced. It would play existing Intellivision cartridges and, with the optional system changer module, also play Atari 2600 cartridges. The Intellivision 3 was announced as the answer to the new, higher resolution ColecoVision system. Intellivision 3 would play existing Intellivision cartridges at normal resolution, plus new, higher resolution cartridges. M Network expanded into computer games for the IBM PC and Apple II. A new programming division was opened in Taiwan to handle the overflow from California. Another programming division was opened in the south of France to develop games for Intellivision's fast-growing European market. The early keyboard component, which had only been released in test markets, was replaced by the Entertainment Computer System. And Mattel Electronics' new non-Intellivision computer system, the Aquarius, made its debut. This aggressive and expensive development took its toll. Mattel Electronics started posting massive losses. It was hoped that the spending would pay off once the new product hit the market. The June 1983 Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago was expected to be the turnaround. Mattel Electronics made a huge splash. While the enthusiasm for Intellivision and its games was still strong, the reception for the new hardware, Intellivision 3, Aquarius, the entertainment computer system, was lukewarm. Too little, too late, commented one analyst. Mattel Incorporated responded by replacing Electronics' top management. A new team was brought in to stress software development over hardware. The new team discontinued the Intellivoice and Aquarius, cancelled the still unreleased Intellivision 3, and put future development of the entertainment computer system at the lowest priority. Over 500 workers were laid off in August. Game development continued, but so did the slide into debt. In October 1983, Mattel Electronics announced losses of over $280 million for the year. More layoffs quickly followed. Down to about 30 people, the software staff spent November and December polishing up their games and their resumes. The remaining programmers were laid off January 20th, 1984. They threw a wake for Intellivision. But Intellivision refused to die. The former marketing VP for Mattel Electronics bought the rights to the system and started INTV Corporation. INTV contracted with some of the original programmers to create new Intellivision games. Running a low overhead operation, INTV was able to supply Intellivision owners with new games throughout the rest of the 1980s. But in 1990, with the rise of new video game systems led by Nintendo, interest in Intellivision games faded. INTV was forced to close up shop. The Blue Sky Rangers, however, lived on. The original programmers, many still working in the game industry, regularly got together for reunions and parties. In June 1995, they started a website about how the Intellivision games were created. The response was overwhelming. Thousands of fans who grew up with Intellivision wrote in, wanting to play the games again. So Intellivision Productions Incorporated was formed to bring the original games to new platforms and to new generations.
more than two decades after the original idea in television lives. Commander. Are you sure? 